Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes. It's a Thursday, so I'm joined by JP Mason. Uh, and I'm a very happy Christmas to you, first and foremost, John Paul. How are you? Merry Christmas to you as well, Paul. Seems like uh, it went by in a, an absolute flash. Didn't yeah. really have any time to get ready for the, the build-up to it. I, just, I was away with, uh, with Mogwai and, and then suddenly came back. It was Christmas Eve and then I found myself in Aberdeen. So... Um, uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was nice to just not do anything for a few days. I don't think uh, I've done that for a consecutive period of time for quite some time this year. Uh, it's been, I, I realised I've, I've exhausted my internal battery, if that is such a thing. Um, so it was good to kind of recharge and I'll be doing more of that in January as well. You've done a lot of gigs, uh, JP, one of which obviously I seen you at just last week. Uh, Mogwai, as you mentioned, four dates. Uh, an absolute colossus of a of a band. Um, I just think the sound that they create is unbelievable. Uh, I wasn't leaving to get a wee bit of respite from the sound. I was leaving to come and say hello to you at the, the merch stall and also uh, to check the score because Celtic were playing Livingston that night. And of course, last night, Celtic were playing Hibs, uh, which is the reason you've put that Celtic away jersey up. Uh, on your, your shelving system behind you. The first thing that I think about when I see that jersey is Lubo Moravchik at Easter Road. Same with yourself? Yeah. Oh, no, totally. I, I was, so I didn't get a ticket last night, but I did watch the game, uh, the full 90 minutes. I got some pelters last week for having not been able to see the game uh, on Wednesday against Livingston. Uh, sometimes... It's beyond your control what you can do, uh, and I was actually at work and unable to get a, a, a stream of it. So yes, I was commenting on a game that I didn't see, which is rare in these, uh, well, not in these times, any times. Um, but yeah, I saw the game last night. I was in the Brazen Head, fine bar, public bar establishment in the Gorbals, and uh, I was thinking as we started to rack up the goals, and it got to three, I was like, when was the last time we hammered Hibs at Easter Road? Because mm. all the game, in recent memory, all the games have been pretty tight. And you, you, you're thinking of like nil-nils when we've gone there to, to try and clinch the league. I remember we're in the pink strip and thinking this is the day we win the league. And then we sort of trudged off uh, with a nil-nil draw and we didn't win it. We obviously won it the following week. And then there's been defeats there as well, damaging defeats uh, at times. And... I was thinking when was the last time we won and, and, and we beat them four, was it four or five one? No, four or five one in uh, 2001 under Martin O'Neill and it was Lennon, uh, sorry, Larson scored, Maravchik scored, um, I forget the rest, but we were wearing that strip. But then just before we came on air, I was flicking through the uh, Celtic Wikipedias just to try and see the sort of pattern of scores and there was a lot of from 2001 onwards, there was a lot of, quite a few draws, a lot of 1-0 wins, mm -hmm. um, a few defeats as well. But then I got up to 2012 and I was like, ah, oh, we beat them 5-0. And I completely forgot about that. I, it was at a time when I didn't, I couldn't get away tickets. I, I wasn't a season ticket holder. It was that four-year spell where I didn't have a season ticket. So my, my access to away tickets was virtually zero. So... For some reason, that game had just slipped out of my mind. But we won 5 0 at Easter Road in 2012. So that was the last time we properly dismantled them. And ever since then, it's been very, it's been a tough venue. Um, it, it has been. It has been. And I think that we, we can't forget that today, uh, going into that game last night, even though we had uh, given them a scene to Celtic Park 6 1 earlier this season. Uh, going into that game, it was a completely different uh, kind of outlook. And uh, you tested me on that 5 0 game. Uh, and and bizarrely Boris. enough, bizarrely enough, by the way, I says to you, what jersey were we wearing? Because mm. the minute you told me it was the the uh, black and yellow design, you know, the kind of like it was set in four sections. Mm -hmm. And then I can see the goals, I can see the celebrations. So I do associate jerseys with goals and players and all that. And after a little bit of um, assistance from yourself, I managed to get the five goal scorers without checking the Celtic wiki. Can anybody in the comment section tell us? the five goals that were scored when we pumped Hibs 5 nothing 
uh, under Neil Lennon it was, eh? Back mm. in 2012. Um, please don't check the wiki. It is a Bible. Date from, from memory. It's good for the old grey matter, JP, when you get to my age, for sure. Um, and it's as I said before, it's an absolute pleasure for uh, JP to join us. We will then go into preparations for the new year and uh, massive plans for a Celtic state of mind in 2023. That's already started with the rebranding of the YouTube channel. And if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't yet subscribed, because bizarrely enough, JP, 55% of our viewers don't hit the subscribe button. Don't be put off by it. It doesn't cost you anything. You can get notifications. And if you're of a Celtic state of mind... Everything that's going to be coming your way is Celtic related. Um, there is going to be another channel for all the other stuff I'm interested in. And by the way, JP and I will still talk about music on a Thursday. Um, JP was a topic of conversation on Wednesday's show with Kevin Graham. So watch one, that one back. Uh, all good, all good, clean fun, of course, JP. Um, <laughs> after watching the game last night um, and then re-watching it again today, um, as I do, because I think, you know, watching it, live, um, there's an emotional element that you need to detach yourself from a wee bit, JP, before you can talk about the game. It's difficult, it really is difficult, I think, to capture um, any kind of meaningful observations and, you know, uh, some might think it's sad, but on the, the day of a bulletin if I'm going to be on, I'll re-watch the game and then, you know, with a fresh set of eyes. So I was watching that again this morning and one of the things that really struck me was um, the, the right-back situation. Now, Obviously, Juranovic is sitting on the bench last night, uh, which I think is great because at the moment we don't have a right-back, a natural right-back fit at the club who's available to play. Obviously, that will change on the 2nd of January because I'm guessing that Alistair Johnson will be fit and we're going to go. Um, however, we've got three options because I don't have an update on Ralston with regards to his availability for the Rangers game. I JP. think he changed the other day, by the way. He changed right, the okay. day before yesterday. So, you know, the more options, the better going into that game. But I don't know what you feel about this. I would be reluctant of the four players who could play right back. I'd be reluctant to play Johnson. I just think you don't play your first game. I, I know what's happened in the past. I would yeah, throw him in. Did the generation not play at left back? Left <laughs> back. Right. Left back. Um, yeah. I, I wouldn't be throwing him in if I could help it. If I could help it. So then it begs the question, right, Hatate, how's he performed at right back? I think he's done admirably well. He scores two goals against St. Johnston from the right back position, JP. Uh, loads of plaudits and rightfully so. I think last night, Hibbs might have targeted him a wee bit and you saw a wee bit of that in the first half. Um, defensively, he obviously isn't a natural defender. He can play there, which is great. But I wouldn't be too keen if there's another option on starting with Hatate right back at Ibrox. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you'd think if Juranovic was on is on, on the bench last night and in the squad, then surely he's of a, a close to some sort of match fitness. Why would you, why would you include him in the squad if he wasn't? Um, he's obviously been training. Yeah, he's just back from the World Cup, but there'll be a few more days of training before Monday now. Don't think it was beyond the realms of possibility that Juranovic could start. The only thing that would be against that in my mind would be as if to go back to something I said a couple of years ago, his his head's out the door. Mm. I, I, I don't I don't think we can afford to have anybody that's not fully tuned into what's going on in terms of the in terms of the game, the importance of it. Um I, I don't know. It, you remember, obviously, Edward. We talked about this last week. Edward and Christie playing in that game at Ibrox when they were they were gone. You yeah. know, they they, they pretty, Edward went the next day, did he not? It, <laughs> it was certainly that week. And, and it was that week. It, it must was have so been frustrating week. when you watch his performance that that day. You know, where where Kyogo lays on a great chance in the first half. I, I, that's mad to think that Kyogo played with Edward, isn't it? I know. Like, I know. It's really weird to think of those two worlds crossing over but I don't think Edward you know deliberately played bad or was was going into that game thinking oh I'm going to not give everything today I just think sometimes when when you are sort of half in half out then it's it's going to it's going to affect whatever you're doing in any walk of life in any situation if you're not fully yeah. committed to your job then you're you're not going to give your all or your 
it's, something's going to fall by the wayside a little bit in the game. And I, obviously that chance, you don't then go, oh, well, Edward's happy at Celtic and he, he puts that chance away. I, I don't think it's necessarily as clear, clear cut as that. But um, I just think with Juranovic, I, 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 if he's fit and his head's right, I would definitely play him over mm-hmm. anybody because... That even even though he's likely to leave next month, I just think, like you said about Johnston's, maybe a little bit wild to put him in straight away at Ibrox. However, he seems like quite a confident guy. He's mm. just played the World Cup. You know, I, I, sh- should Ibrox really be this sort of daunting venue for him if he's just played at the World? I know the crowds at the World Cup weren't exactly a lion's den, etc. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I don't think it would phase him. I think he would probably relish it. But Juranovic, given his inclusion in the squad last night, would, would make the most sense. Ralston is a doubt because he wasn't even in the squad last night. And that's correct, right? He wasn't on the bench. Ralston no. wasn't. No. He wasn't. So he seems a bit far away from playing at the moment. And I just, I would rather have Hattati in his natural position if he's going to play anywhere. But then you've got the conundrum of what about Aaron Moy? The Aaron Moy exactly. scenario, which has suddenly become. You will, the whole Celtic end last night at, at the end of the game sporadically singing uh, Aaron Moy to Daddy Cool, which was, that's never been heard before last night. There's no way that's like been about. That's one of those very organic, natural Celtic like player songs that just come out of nowhere that sometimes just happen. They've happened before in the past. I'm trying to rack my brain to think of them, but. Um, I don't know, I'm pretty sure Sean Maloney had one at Falkirk away one Rem- time. Remember Tony Watt? What was the Tony Watt one? I-, I was going to sing it for you there, but I'm trying to remember who actually sang it. Um, Tony Watt, Tony Watt, Tony, Tony oh, Watt. That uh, one. I mean, um, the thing, things like that, you know, that that honestly, to me, I've never heard anybody singing Aaron Moy to that. I mean, they sang it to Johnny Hayes. Mm-hmm. Remember, it, jo- Johnny Hayes got it at Ibrox when he scored. <laughs> um but last night, it was full full end, and it was it was brilliant to see because the guy's taken so much stick since he's come to the club. Bizarrely, no. bizarrely, Jamie. well, even if he has a good game, there's still you look I down the comments. Oh, but he's, he's slower than a week in the jail and all that, and you're like, <laughs> if the guy can play like that and he's a little bit slower than the next player, the player next to him, I, I don't have an issue because he's. I I got up off my seat and cheered on Saturday against St Johnston when he I think he kind of like lifted it over a player's head and caught it on the other side and then let the ball move away from him and then shifted it and passed an amazing pass he was like spraying passes across the whole pitch and I, I honestly celebrated it like a goal because I, I, I thought it was immense on Saturday it and he was. just carried, that, carried <laughs> that into last night and then gets two goals including a penalty JP's dropped out, um, but he will be back. He'll click on that link and come back into the stream. In the meantime, I will be bringing in some of your comments. Uh, Jungle Lion, Juranovic definitely back on Monday. I think um, the same. I think Juranovic will be back on Monday. And then uh, the big question is, who drops out of the the midfield? Yeah, that was, that was bizarre, JP. That was this bizarre. Just something, disappeared. Something, something went wrong with the, the, the stream yard thing and it just... Came, came mm-hmm. Well, you know, maybe you were talking too much sense, JP, and it's, no. it's thought, no, yeah. I, I can't be having that. No, but it's true, though, with, with regards to Moy, right, because, yeah, we do create a perception in our minds of players. We, we all do it, and, and I think that, though, what happens is you can change your mind. I mean, I was never a massive fan of Greg Taylor, um, mm. probably pre ange I was never a massive fan of Greg Taylor. And I remember speaking to to Kev Graham about this and saying that, you know, there may be something else in Greg Taylor that we've not seen yet because I had I had kind of witnessed him in and around the Celtic team uh, on a trip to uh, an away game uh, in Europe. And I thought that it was incredible to witness just how influential he seemed to be behind the scenes, JP. Mm. And I remember saying that to Kev Graham. I said, he, he, you know, it looks as though he's a bit of a, a character in amongst the squad, but I wasn't seeing it on the pitch. And then Ange comes in, and I think Taylor and Ralston have both been completely transformed. Um, but Kev gave them captain material and got absolutely ridiculed for it. He I did. don't know what Kev was basing that on at that particular time, but it was a good while ago. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember him getting totally slated, whereas now it doesn't really seem beyond the realms of possibility that if, well, obviously, you've got strong contenders in Cameron Carter Vickers and, and Joe Hart to deputise if McGregor isn't uh, fit or available. But I wouldn't bat an eyelid at Greg Taylor being made the captain because he really does instil something from that position in the park and on the pitch and off the pitch as well, like you said, with the little videos that you see and, and, right. and things like that. But I think I think the important thing is, fair enough, you can like maybe not be over, like, overly you know impressed with a signing or anything like that, but I think it's, it's this weird fixation on going completely studs up on a player before he's really had the chance to, to prove himself. You can be like, oh, well, maybe I think we could do better in that position or something like that, be a bit more diplomatic, but some people really did go studs up. I remember hearing them being called a joke of a player. Yeah, that's right. A joke of a player. I know. International midfielder playing at the World Cup and now is being lauded by the entire away support. So things like that really do come back to, to bite you. Um, and I just I just think any time someone's got a Celtic jersey in their possession, they've got an opportunity to make people like us look foolish. And that's why you should never, you should never go studs up. Uh, maybe Def- I, I, definitely I, when I, he's not kicked a ball, he's never kicked a ball, and, and he's been getting called a joke of a player. And the thing well, about that, JP, yeah, sorry, it, it wasn't you know how in uh, kind of modern parlance, a joke of a player or a joke of a goal can mean a good thing. Oh, he was an absolute joke of it, but in a good way. It wasn't that; it, it was being critical of the player, uh, and that was before he's kicked a ball for Celtic. And I think, you know. Once you see the performances and it's there in black and white, you've got to change your view on the player and very quickly. And I think, Moy, the very fact we're going to the Ibrox on Monday and we're thinking, right, if Juranovic comes back in, you don't really want to be dropping Hatati. So mm. Hatati goes back into midfield. Who drops out? It's a massive dilemma. It's a huge dilemma. Well, I saw a lot of Hibs fans... I've got a friend, Matty, who does a Hibs podcast called Long Bangers. don't know if you've seen that. Uh, and the, I remember you mentioned it before. But yeah. I, I will. My Hibs staff has been involved with Hibs.net and all sorts. And he actually hired me for uh, the banking job that I did way back when in a different life. And I've I've always got on well with Matty. In fact, he's the guy that uh, caught me undercover at Easter Road when I had a, a home end ticket when Stuart Armstrong scored the drew one one, and it, we just. We just met eyes as we were coming out of whatever stand it was, I don't know, and he kind of looked over and he just, in disgust, well, not amazement and disgust that I was in the Hibs end, because he obviously knows I'm not a Hibs fan. <laughs> and I went over and put my arm around him and just went, I'm undercover, keep it quiet. <laughs> um, so, but Matty it obviously does long bangers with a couple other guys and watched that kind of grow over the last year or, or so. And, I, you know, you see long bangers retweeting comments by Hibs fans and obviously the majority of them were kind of like well we had we absolutely got our proverbial mm-hmm. uh, rear ends handed to us last night but a lot of them were saying why did nobody why did nobody go man marking on Moy from the first 15 minutes because he was just getting all the space in the world so if we do do go Moy on Monday then you might think that they might do the same number on him on Monday I don't know. I, that's just speculation. I've no idea what they'll do or what yeah. they'll come at us with. But to get their crowd going, they're going to have to come at us. And they have to come at us anyway because we're nine points clear of them. So it's not as if they've got any way of like not going for the jugular. But then that leaves them vulnerable to a very, very good Celtic side that's firing on all cylinders at the moment. So that if they leave holes and go gung-ho against us to get the crowd going then depending on how it goes, it'll be a bit of a kind of boxing match early on, I think, you know, and who, who can land a who can land a blow early on that might end up proving crucial towards the end. And he wouldn't back against us to do it in the way in the form we're in. I can't imagine their support are relishing that game on Monday, given even last night they won three 0 and they weren't they didn't seem very happy about it, including the manager. He's Sort of said, oh yeah, it was oh, it was okay, but you know, we're going away at Easter Road and, and hammering Hibs four 0 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people will say, oh well, it's only Hibs and 
blah blah blah. But as, the, as I said at the start, it's a difficult venue. It's a venue where we've all notoriously struggled um, in recent times. What was it? One win in nine, I think, was the, was the was the was the last yeah the last result, set of results. So that's a good barometer for for where we are at right now. And last Wednesday, by the way, we were or last Thursday rather, we were only commenting on what's seemed a pretty low par or below par game on, on the Wednesday night against Livingston and I, obviously I was only going by what I heard from people because obviously I wasn't there but the people that I'd spoken to have just been like oh it was one of those games uh, and even the guys that sit behind me on Saturday at the St Johnston game was like how was Wednesday and they were like you didn't miss much so we were kind of okay we got the win but we were right to be a bit what's what's going on here why is everyone kind of like dipped their yeah. level Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you come back on Saturday and you were saying to me, do you think there'll be mass changes on Saturday? And I was like, well, I don't think there will be. And ended up there only being like, what, three changes or something like that? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think Jota was an interesting one. I really yeah. do. Um, no, but you're right, JP. It's not as though we were doom and gloom. And, you know, we were talking about, I think the title of the, the show in, in particular was, um, the specific <laughs> show was uh, around what changes is Ange going to make? But that was on the back of what Ange had said after the game against Livingston. Unacceptable. Yeah. And, um, you know, we weren't saying, you know, like you you were saying last week, chuck the baby out with the bathwater. We weren't saying that. We're just saying, right, Ange has stated there's going to be changes. What changes do you think he's going to make? Um, and Jota, yeah, he's not been great at since, you know, after the World Cup. But I, I've got to look also at the fact that over the season, he has been bloody good. You know, his performances mm-hmm. have been excellent. And, you know, it looks to me, that's another posi- position I want to talk about on Monday. It looks to me as though there are big decisions in, a, in some key areas of the park. And the, the first one we're discussing here is Juranovic. Um, IH decorating comes in to say Juranovic may have to play left back if Taylor is injured. O'Reilly needs a wee spell on the bench. Moy and Maeda deserve a start at Ibrox with Kyogo up front. Every single part of that is a talking point. Um, but apparently... Greg Taylor tweeted last night that he is fit for Monday. So I the, the, you said that he's post match. They asked him how is Taylor and he went, Oh, he's okay. I think he just needed so he said he's okay. So he didn't say there was any concern over him. So I... Yeah. So do you play Hatati? Um and if so, is his defensive qualities really going to be tested on Monday? I think they will be because yeah, I I've sure. seen a first 20 minutes of the game it's easy to say the first 5 minutes of the game I thought the first 20 minutes of the game was a bit topsy-turvy last night and I thought that Hibs were kind of targeting Hatati. he came on to have a, a really good game as it happens you know he, he crossed the ball in for Maeda's header off the bar just before the goal that we'll get onto by the way what a strike what a what a goal um, and I, I was watching a couple of things he was giving away possession a, a fair bit even from a throw-in at one point mm. it was as if he was rattled a wee bit um, and I think he came onto a decent game. I thought he was brilliant against St Johnston. After the game, Ange talks about the fact, JP, that the players are comfortable on the ball and they're comfortable within certain positions on the park. So Hatati mm-hmm. has been in these areas previously, although not positioned it right back. Therefore, he's comfortable and I totally understand it. However, if Juranovic is fit, he plays. If Juranovic is fit, he plays right back. And, mm-hmm. and the, then the real dilemma is, who drops out of that midfield? Now, based on form, it cannot be Moy. Based on form, you can't drop Moy. Because I agree with you, I thought he was brilliant against St. Johnston and he was probably at his best last night that we've seen him at. So you can't drop him. You're not dropping the, the captain. And then that's where IH Decorating comes in with the O'Reilly suggestion. I don't think he's been at his absolute best. But I was watching again the performance this morning. I was watching it again. I thought he was very creative. I thought he was he was playing some really killer balls in behind the Hibs defence. Mm. He had two chances last night to open his, his goal scoring account for the season and he didn't score. And I think that's becoming a wee bit of frustration for him. Oh definitely. But is he playing badly enough to be dropped? So th- these are these are the big decisions that are going to be made. You make the argument that O'Reilly O'Reilly's play has allowed uh, Moy to play as well as he has, because mm-hmm. it's not as if Moy's this sort of virtuoso one man band who isn't relying on his teammates to to help him play better. I mean most most top players always say uh unless they're messy <laughs> or something like that, they would always say that it's thanks to the, the quality of the teammates that they've got around them. So 
it's a, it's a, it seemed to me last night that it was a cohesive midfield and Moy gives and goes. He, he, he's always always recycling the ball really calmly, really sensibly. He doesn't he only go for a, an outlandish pass if he knows he hundred percent can make it. There's very rare it's very rare that he tries to pull off a like a phenomenal pass and he doesn't make it. Any other time it's like not keep it simple. Close have O'Reilly and McGregor close by to him and obviously uses the inverted fullbacks as well to, to, to recycle possession or whatever. But I don't I, I, I really don't know. It's a massive headache for for Ange Postacoglu to, to go into the Monday's game with an embarrassment of riches in, in midfield. And considering we were talking on Wednesday last week that some people would maybe lost their pizzazz a little bit. It's funny how it comes back in, in the advent of uh, such a huge, huge game where players know and... I, th- I saw a tweet this morning, that, uh, I think it was like Celtic Coats or something, and it had this, this scoreboard from when we beat them 5-1 at Ibrox, which to this day is one of the best days of my life. It, was just, it just seemed to banish so much, so many ghosts from the 90s where we absolutely just, dis- I and mean, it should have been more as well. We should have, we should have, I think we should have won about 7 or 8-1 that day. I mean, was- That's a regret. That's a regret. <laughs> Sitters missed, Sinclair missed a sitter, if, if I remember rightly, ballooned it over the bar. I know you can't really grumble when you're hammering them 5-1 in their own back garden, but um, the, the Tierney quote was, we went there and done that to them in their own place, and it, that, and it meant it meant everything, and you're just like, aye. Well, that, that's, the, the players will fully know from guys like McGregor and Forrest and uh, you know anybody else that's been about the club for uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, who's been about the club for a long time? You know, you you want to make a name for yourself in this football team and this football club, and put yourself down in history. You go and do something there, and it and it gets remembered. We all talk about, always talk about players that scored the Ibrox, Craig Bellamy, Scott McDonald. You know, there's Tony Cascarino. Well, <laughs> yes, so, but like obviously, there's the numerous Larson goals and and things like yeah. Alan Thompson. Um, th- th- those 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 are the memories that really ingrain themselves. Samaras, you, you rem- Samaras, like, you remember goals by Celtic players at Ibrox far more than you do. No disrespect, but Easter Road 2012, like when we were trying to remember those the names of those yeah. players. I don't know mm-hmm. if anyone's actually come up with them yet um, in the comments, but it's easier to remember uh, a goal scorer in a game there. So that's. Might have an, an, an might be an indication of why everybody's suddenly starting to step up in terms of form. Yeah, but we'll see. You know that's an interesting one there. Uh, the goals we'll get to the goals. Uh, some real real quality in the goal scoring last night. But you're talking about form. Maeda's coming to form and Moyes coming to form, right? And these are two players that at various parts of the season they'd have been completely overshadowed by the form of let's say Jota and O'Reilly in those mm-hmm. positions, right? Um, and I don't think we've seen it yet, but when in Abada as well, um, obviously he, he I don't think last night was his his best performance. But if all these players all hit form at the same time, that's a frightening prospect. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it's one of these things, JP, that, you know, it normally happens <coughs> two, two or three players at a time are really in a purple patch. Last night, Maeda was untouchable. I mean, I was watching it again this morning. He, he was on fire. He was unbelievable. I, we'll get to the goal. The goal reminds me of a goal that used to be on one of the old Celtic VHS videos that I'm, you know, working my way through on the channel. And it was a goal scored by Frank McGarvey, right, at Easter Road. And he's he's wearing the white Celtic away jersey with the, the green pinstripe. Mm-hmm. Vintage, absolutely vintage jersey from 82, 83. And it was the way he picks the ball up and he looks as though he's going to be losing the ball at some point. But he goes on this, be- I wouldn't call it a mazy run with Frank McGarvey. It was more of a bendy run. He's just bending in and out of the players. And he strikes this thing. And some of the, the commenters will remember this goal. And he strikes this thing. It's a cracking goal. And that put me in mind last night when Maeda did that. Because I thought when he, he picks falls, the ball up... He falls and then gets back up off the ground. So he falls as he's trying to start his run and then gets back up. Beats the man easily, absolutely rinses him, and then the Hibs defence are just kind of going. I mean, my mate Chris said last night when the defending there's absolutely shocking. I mean, mm. it kind of is. They, com- they completely stand off him. It's 
kind of like when uh, we stood off McManaman and against Liverpool. Oh, I know, I know. Or oh, remember the Kilmarnock the, uh, League Cup final? I remember it, it starts off with Ki Sung Young losing the ball. No, mm. we lose the ball near the, the corner flag, and Ki Sung Young's got an opportunity just to take the man out. And you know, he's he's probably 10 yards in the Kilmarnock half, so he's going to get a booking, but it's worth taking, and he doesn't. Mm. And like you say, at no point do we close them down. Um, yeah. So yeah, it must have been a nightmare for Hibs last night. Oh no, hundred percent. I mean, he, he, Ange Postecoglou said after the game, he was like, "I think people need to realise that this guy has got, you know, de- de- determination levels beyond most other players, and sometimes he he'll chase things down, he'll harry, he'll put a lot of effort in and not get any reward. But if he because he consistently does it." then you've got to think that at some point he will get his reward. And well, he, he could have had a hatchet last night. Mm-hmm. Two headers and, a, and an absolute cracking uh, smash for outside the box. But when he went for that header, I was like, no way. It, lo- it definitely looked like it was going in because the camera swung round and then the way that he, the angle he headed the ball at, you're like, that's going into the bottom corner. But then the camera kind of swung around quickly and you're like, oh no, it's going wide. But And then he's diving header off the bar Every, like a few people around the boat are like, oh, he should be scoring that, he should be scoring that. And I'm like, well, he's done everything right. And obviously, yeah, it hits the bar. But it's, it's not as if he skied it over the bar. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> he got a good connection on it. And it maybe came at him, you know, as a, a wee bit late. I can't remember if it took a nick when it came over, the, the cross came over. But, I mean, he didn't let it get down. He didn't let it get him down because within, what, two minutes, he picks the ball up. And like Ange Postecoglou said, he will not let things de- like put him off. You know, so other players, you know, I think Matt O'Reilly gets affected by missing a shot. The shoulders go down. Yeah, the shoulders go down, and and I, I you remember Larson used to always slap his knee when he like aggressively slap his knee when he missed a shot. He was raging with himself, but then uh, Larson's a different a different being. I mean, I think he could. Uh, He'll get another opportunity and just put it away. But I think sometimes it can af- affect players' heads yeah, if they mm-hmm. miss a good chance or something like that. Whereas, you know, my head is just tunnel vision. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'll go again, and he got his goal. Total focus. But like you say, when he picks the ball up, he's got no right to score a goal. No right from that position to score a no. goal. It's, it's uh, one of, if not the finest goals we've seen this season. Um, it's up there with the one that was not, uh, chopped off at Fur Park by Jota. We'll get to Jota, by the way. It's up there with Kyogo's, Kyogo's last night as well. It was absolutely ridiculous. Oh, it, was, it was tremendous. I know. I mean, oh. the touch. You know, we, we speak about Kyogo, and we will speak about him, because um, just yesterday, actually, before the game, I was talking about some of the the figures that Alan Morrison had published on Twitter, talking about the conversion rate of Kyogo being quite a bit better than Edward throughout Edward's career, and he's kind of lauded as being a prolific striker at Celtic. But Kyogo is prolific, and yes, there are chances missed. That there, there definitely is. But you look at the quality last night of the way that he, he gathers that ball, um, and then there's still a lot of work to do to create the the space because you've got the Rocky behind you, you've got to you know create space from him behind you. Uh, he's trying to cover Hanlon, it is whose position it is terrible from a Hibs perspective. Um, and then the finish absolutely brilliant. The finishing was the quality was unbelievable last night. Um, Francis McDonald, is it not possible to keep Patati at right back? Well, I just feel that if you're right back who's come back from a brilliant World Cup and you've seen how well you know that that has done for Maeda and Moy. You know, getting a really good World Cup under their belts, JP, they've come back, they've been in great form for Celtic. Juranovic, obviously, has been hindered by the injury that he picked up and it kept him out of the third and fourth place playoff. You play him. If he's fit, you play him. I don't think there's any debate about that. I think the, the debate then moves into the midfield position. Um, again, Evange calls on Hatate. Who are we to argue? But I just think that, you know, there was a sign last night with Juranovic being on that bench, JP, ah, that, you know, he's going to be in, I hope, on Monday. Let me know, anybody in the comment section, if you've got a ticket, by the way, for Monday as well. JP, I'm guessing you've not got one? No chance. No nah, chance. I mean, it's, it's absolutely brutal that, I think somebody tweeted the other day, or I saw a tweet from someone saying, 
supposedly one of the biggest derbies in European football and this is the away allocation and they showed the Celtic end at what is the Celtic end now at Ibrox and you're just like it's never going to it's never going to go back I, I, they're they've dug their heels in they've, they've made a rod to their own back in terms of what their fans expect now and the way that they've sold the season tickets or however it is they've structured it or, or, or sold it to to their fans and mm. um, and you just kind of see us getting that allocation back, which means that the days of getting a ticket for Ibrox are are long gone, and it's a closed shop, rightly so, in terms of the people that go all the time. You know, I don't think anybody should be getting a ticket for Ibrox that hasn't been in a away game this season, for example. I think that's mental, because um, the, the allocation is so small. But, um, aye, it's just frustrating, because it's always a good trip. Not always. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been there in the wrong end of uh, uh, some horrible, horrible days and horrible results. But when you go there and, and it's a good day, <laughs> it becomes a great day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember, I mean, being in the broom loan, the, the day that we, um, and we mentioned Samaras before, I wasn't actually at that particular game, but um, the, the nothing each game where Samaras misses a penalty, uh, mm. McGregor saved the penalty. And I just remember that moment, JP, where there's a coming together of Chris Commons and Samaras before the penalty kick, where they both want to take it. And we've mm. seen that before uh, in the past. And we've seen it with, um, I remember Stefan Johansson and Lee Griffiths. And Griffiths fell out with him, surprisingly mm. enough. And then there was the um, Simon Lynch and Sean Maloney at Tynecastle. So it has happened. But there was just that moment. And I, and I just remember thinking at that point, know that I'm Nostradamus, oh no, we're going to miss this. I, and my confidence was completely drained because there was just that moment of doubt, JP, between Samaras and Commons, you know, who's going to take this? And Samaras is like, I'm taking it. And I just thought to myself, we're going to miss it and miss it we did. And had we scored that goal and won that game, we'd have won the league that season. Mm-hmm. And that was, a bit, that was how big that was. And yes, it's poor. It really is poor form. Um, but, you know, it was created, like John Hughes and I spoke about um last week or a week before, it was created by Rangers and obviously Celtic aren't going to bend over and just give them their full allocation as before yeah. if we're not going to be treated the same way. And it's at that point, what should have happened is the authority should have stepped in. It's not happened. They're just getting let to run riot um, as they have done previously. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's, I've said this before, I'm sure there's plenty of their fans that are, are irked by the fact that they kind of get a ticket for Celtic Park because there's the exact same problem in reverse that there'll be people that go every week to watch um, to watch them and they kind of get a ticket for Celtic Park because of the, the low allocations and so they'll have that gripe but I just get the feeling that it, it's, it's going to become the norm and it has become the norm it's been like that for what, four years Including COVID, four years. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, yeah, because remember the the game in March that was eventually called off. Mm-hmm. That was a that was a reduced allocation that day, wasn't it? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, Nin- 19, I, no, uh, I was 2019. Planning, yeah, I was planning to go to. I was planning to go to the pub with my mate to watch that, and then mm-hmm. suddenly you weren't allowed to go to the pub with your mate to do anything as of that weekend, basically. So. Well, there was no there was no game anyway, but you were. I don't think you would have been allowed to congregate in a pub that 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 day. But I think you you've not asked me, but I'm going to tell you anyway. My favourite Ibrox memory, Henrik Larsson's fiftieth goal. I mean that that was that that still feels like a dream sequence in my memory when it, when he when he rolled it in and then he just ran right forward to us and gave it the <laughs> and everyone and everyone jumped on top of him. It's in my mind's eye, I can be right in that moment in the seat that I was in watching it and just looking over at their fans in absolute disgust. Well, they were in disgust at the fact that it had happened. And then if you remember, because it had been so long that we hadn't won at Ibrox for about maybe five or six years maybe at that point, maybe Fair. maybe more. I think John Collins's free kick was the last time we'd won at Ibrox. And Larson, you see Larson mouthing to... I don't know if it was Alan Thompson or whoever, but you see, if you watch the end highlights, he mouths about time. You actually can read his lips when he says about time because he'd never won at Ibrox in in the three or uh, four years that he'd been at Celtic at that point. That's scary. Um, 
He never that won. Is, yeah, that, that that is like you say that there was that whole fortress mentality. I remember when you look back on the Vim Janssen season, you know, we only ever beat Rangers once under Vim Janssen it, and it was mm. the, the New Year game. Um and it was uh, Burley and Lambert, wasn't it? Two 0 mm-hmm. Stephen Farrell, hail hail boys, stunning last night. All the best from Red Car Boys C S C all the best to you guys as well. Hopefully you have a, a tremendous new year. I'm gonna ask JP something about uh, music, so Prepare yourself for this. <laughs> Looking back on 2022, Facebook user, hi boys. All the best for a happy second of January when it comes. Yes, uh, looking forward to that already. And um, as I say, big plans for next year as well. Don't get to watch live very often, says Poshko Ross M. So good to see you guys. Beric CSC, great to see you as well. Get involved as much as you possibly can. Subscribe, it's all free. And um, there's loads of content planned for next year but uh, Strange Love the Doctor comes in here you started at Strange Love the Doctor you're talking music so we're going to run with this uh, Polyphia at the garage is the only gig I'm interested in going to in the new year other than that it's all a bit me 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 right so it opens this discussion JP what is your best gig of the year you have seen many tell me your finest gig of the year uh, ah, that's a hard one ah. Do you know what? It was probably in terms of it wasn't an actual gig; it was part of a festival, mm-hmm. and, I, and I have and just because it was the first time I'd ever seen him playing what was essentially his own set because I'd only ever seen him supporting somebody before. But Beck saw Beck at Rockwerkter in a sort of twenty thousand capacity tent slash hangar, and it was just I mean I I, lo- I lo- absolutely love Beck and. I've, I've become a bigger fan of him since the last time I saw him when he supported Radiohead at mm. Meadowbank Stadium in 2005 or six, I think it was. And I liked him then, but he didn't really have as much material as he does now. The material he's released since then has become some of my favourite uh, albums, the Morning Phase and things like that. So him in the ten, and he did a cover of uh, Everybody's Got to Learn Sometime by the Corgis. Um, which was in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and he did a cover of Daniel Johnson's True Love Will Find You in the End, which is, I think, one of the best songs of all time. And he did that, just him and acoustic guitar in this massive tent. It was, it was amazing. But gig, actual gig, I don't think I can see past The Cure and The Twilight Sad. And I know that's maybe a bit biased, but seeing The Cure in Glasgow for the first time in 30 years indoors, and doing that show, playing the new songs, which I hadn't listened to in advance. They're all on YouTube and all that, but I didn't listen to any of that. I, I wanted to hear them myself for the first time. Mm-hmm. I was sitting with James from the sad and his dad, and it was just a really great experience, great moment. And uh, I, I would say it was that. I mean, there's been loads. I've, seen, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to, to go to a lot this year as well as working a lot, but those are the two that, that, that stand out. Superb. I saw you at the Twilight Sad at the Barras as well earlier on this year. Course, I was just going to yeah, yeah. I was going to drop you a wee bit of trivia about um, Beck, right? Do you know the connection between Beck and the Stone Roses? I don't know. Here we go. Right. As you'll know, the Stone Roses signed a massive record deal with Geffen for their second mm-hmm. album, The Second Coming, which took a long, long time to come. A wee bit like my book. <laughs> <laughs> I think they took uh, was wait a minute there was five years between the first and the second album so it mm. took a while right um, and they did a video for Love Spreads which I love I think that's a superb song there's a mm. poster just over there I'm looking at a poster over there with a wee cherub on it and they done an American version of that that video for MTV as was the deal back then and there's a guy who's like you know walking about he's got a hat on in the video and he, I don't know what you call it, prospecting for gold. He's, he's looking for gold, right? Mm-hmm. But the old fool's gold thing in it. It's Beck. Beck's in the video. John Squire's playing the guitar. Beck's in the Stone Roses video. No Spreads. idea. Check it out on YouTube. He's on there. It's the, the US version of Love Spreads. And there's Beck, who was also in Geffen. That was the connection. All right, I get it. I get so it. there um, you go. Interesting uh, fact. I also need to remind, not remind you, but tell you that uh, Stuart from Mogwai brought up uh, some chat you gave him when you were doing the interview with him about um, how Bertie Old, is it Bertie Old and Jimmy Johnston were like right into UFOs? <laughs> did, 
Did you tell him that? <laughs> Aye, Jimmy Johnson was into UFOs because I was looking at Spaceships Over Glasgow, which was his book. Yeah. And we were in the Jimmy Johnson Academy uh-huh. at the time. And I told yeah. him, I says, you know, Jinky was into UFOs. I know, he brought it up. He was telling Martin in the, in the, uh, in the dressing room before the gig. Um, he was like, oh, I've got some patter about UFOs <laughs> and Celtic players. Because like, he, he like, sure uh, believes he saw a UFO somewhere around, in or around Glasgow. I think he was with Dominic, the, the right. bass player. Mm-hmm. And he, it's in the book. Um Available in all good publishers, um, and I've I've been reading the book and it's absolutely amazing. Like, I love it. Like, love they, it. They, they, they relate moments in their career to Celtic victories. By the way, that's a thing. I know. Like, you will you'll know from reading it. But like, like like Martin, obviously diehard Celtic fan, and in the days before the internet, like not not been able to find out the score, and I think he phoned home or something to find out when we beat Rangers five one, the Moravchik game mm-hmm. at Celtic Park, and he phoned home and. He was told the score was 5-1 and immediately just thought, oh my God, we've been beat off them 5-1. And then his sister was like, no, it's Celtic won 5-1. And then that, like Stuart said, that made the night even better. And they just all went on a, a, a drinking rampage uh, after it to celebrate uh, wherever they were in the world at that time. So um, kind there of- is enough there is enough Celtic references in that book, um, for but, sure. But to allow it to be mentioned on uh, a football podcast, how dare oh. we? Oh, absolutely. And of course, the Seville story, because Mogwai during the, the game were at John Peel in, in London. They were actually doing a session yeah. with John Peel. I don't think I've game. got to that yet. I'm not right. I, won't, to that. I won't ruin it. I won't ruin yeah. it for you, JP. Maybe I already have. John Hill um, can't play Hatati at right back. I agree with you, John. Um, at Ibrox, they will target him. Need proven right back at Ibrox. Last time they started fast, they did. I'm thinking they remember the. Um, uh, Aaron Ramsey. Aaron Ramsey. He's he's the player that had just disappeared from my mind. There, Aaron Ramsey scored a very early goal at Ibrox, and um, I think th- there would also be um, there would be a real issue. I think with, with regards to a player going to Ibrox and, and having a really bad game, I think it can really harm your confidence. Um, didn't we see that with Lewis Morgan? I think we've seen mm-hmm. it with Mikey Johnson at mm-hmm. one point as well, playing him out of position centre forward it was on both of those occasions didn't work out and the player seems to get the blame but you know Hatati's done well He's, you know he could probably do exactly the same at left back if you asked them but if we've got a fit right back play the right back that would always be my rule JP every time mm-hmm. particularly at Ibrox as well Pete O'Reilly does need resting but we probably need his height at Ibrox I've seen a lot of chat about O'Reilly getting rested has he been playing that bad? Some, no, wait a minute. This rested patter, that, that's something that um, my friend pointed out to me yesterday when I said about rest. Like, she was like, why would you rest anybody? They've just had six weeks off or the Aye. thick end of six weeks off. It's, it, they're hardly like burnt out at this point in the in the season. So I don't know about resting. You're either talking about resting somebody or you're talking about dropping somebody. It's not a case mm-hmm. of, oh, well, we're resting them. You're saying dropping them. Because there's no reason for fitness levels to be dropping Matt Riley. He's not he's not performing at a lower fitness level or he's 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 burnt out or anything like that. I, I don't think that's the case. Thanks. It's a great point, JP, because if you look at O'Reilly, uh, he was one of the players that when we made those substitutions at that period of the game, if you're just looking at the, the league games here, he was often the one that, that would be hooked. So you see a lot of his performances going back to... Um, Hearts where we beat them 2-0 and he's, he's taken off at 72 minutes followed by 62, 72, 65, 68, 66 so he's not finishing 90 minutes however um, if you look at you know he then had a run of uh, four games where he's played the full 90 then followed by an 82 minutes he was hooked obviously last night after 84 so he is playing a lot more full games he's not you know the go-to who come off at 65 minutes. Maybe a, a big part of that has been the fact that um, we've not had the same cover in the midfield. Obviously, we had the Callum McGregor injury, followed by the right-back situation, which has then taken Hitati out, so maybe he's been forced to play more minutes. Um, and if that's the case, you know, maybe we should be expecting to play 90 minutes every other week. There were certain players like um, Tommy Rogic, who, you know, if he, if he gave you 60 and he scored a goal, great, you were quite happy for him to come off. But I think O'Reilly, um, maybe in the early part of the season, looked as though he was tiring quite a bit and he was coming off, but he started to com- complete 90 minutes a lot more now. Does he need rested? I don't think it's a you know a point of him being rested. I just think that 
Ange will look at that game at Ibrox on Monday. Nothing would surprise me, JP. You know, if I see that starting lineup and Moy isn't in it, it wouldn't surprise me, even though I don't think on form he should be dropped. But um, obviously, th there will be a plan in place with regards to the way that Ange lines up. Um, and Michael Ross actually comes in. O'Reilly looks like he needs dropped, so never mind rested. He looks like he needs dropped. Um, it seems to be a common, uh, a common thought process on O'Reilly, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, to me, I don't know what that's getting based on. Is it because he's missed a few chances? People think he's maybe not quite at it. But I, I thought he that. was sensational when, when he was covering for McGregor, right? Yeah. And obviously he's now been playing in his more natural position. Um mm -hmm. And I don't think he's having a bad game. I really don't. I, when I look at his performance, even he's last night. He's not 9 out of 10, but he's, he's certainly not 4 out of 10. Nah, he's not droppable. Well, he's droppable, but he's not playing so bad you drop him, I don't think. I just, mm. you know, and Hatate again. Yeah, he's played a couple of games at right back. He might end up on the bench <laughs> because he's getting dropped from the right back position. There's maybe no space for him in midfield. It's mm. a great dilemma for, for Ange to have. Another one. You know, earlier in the season, JP, if you'd say to him, we're going to go to Ibrox and Jota will be on the bench because he's not at it, I'd be amazed at that because I thought he had, he's had, he had a really good start to the season. But he's not really played brilliantly. Um, Pataudry, a lot of our play went down the left, but then since, you know, in the first half that was, but then since that kind of half-time break, he's not really performed. And I think I'd be really surprised if, if he was thrown back in, but... I looked at last night and Abada wasn't brilliant last night. Who's your wingers? Maeda's undroppable. I'm sorry. Maeda is undroppable for Monday. 100%. 100%, 100 so, is Maeda. So who else? Is it Abada or Jota? Because I know... I, I prefer well, Jota on the left. Well, I know. Great <laughs> options to have. Great options to have. You prefer Jota on the left? Is that what you said there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do. I don't prefer him to Maeda. I just prefer Jota. I think he's more effective on the left. Uh, than he is on the right. I've got a feeling he'll play Abada. I don't know. I just think Abada causes absolute chaos with him mm -hmm. and, and just doesn't give them a minute's peace. Well, Pop knows exactly the spaces that they that they leave um, to pop up in. He's done it more than once now. Um, I don't know. It, it's, again, up front, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of the, the wingers anyway. We've got options all over it's not like we're putting square pegs in round holes, apart from it right back potentially. Um, but hopefully, like you say, that doesn't it doesn't come to that. Um, by the way, you mentioned Rogic there. He's he's certainly come to life in the last few weeks, hasn't he? Yes. Uh, West, Brom, West Brom fans tweeting going. By the way, everything that we heard from Celtic fans is right. This guy's absolute sauce. I, like, saw, I saw like, that. Some of the balls he's like, you know, that one the set the goal he set up the other night, the goal he scored. I think he's on like two or three assists and a goal in the last three games. Um, they're, they're seeing the real Tommy Rogic, aren't they? And I, you know the thing with that, when he scores that absolutely tremendous goal and he just, he, he just it's almost as if he laughs. You know, it's not as, as if he's happy. Like Aaron Moy scored the goals last night and he was ecstatic and he's, and he's smiling and all the rest of it. Tommy Rogic, when he does something amazing, it's almost as if he laughs at it, as if to say, oh, check out what I just did there. Um, but I, I did see that there's been a change in management, isn't there, recently, or fairly yeah. recently. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that's a great thing with Twitter. You can tap into West Brom uh, fans and see what they're saying about it. And they reckon that he's much better suited under the current manager. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I don't even him. know who the current manager is, and I know I know it was Steve Bruce that brought him in. Um, uh, Richard Beale was the caretaker from October the twenty fifth, um, and then it's Carlos um, Corberan, who is yeah, the manager. It, so. He's only thirty nine. He's only thirty nine years of age. That's incredible. Mm. He's been in management for a few years now. Um, yeah, so Tommy Rogic is doing doing the business down south. Jamesy boy. 88 can't really afford to keep playing players out of position. Absolutely, if you can, if you can help it, don't do it. They get found out eventually. Uh, and IPOX, not the place for that. I'm going to bring this one up from Facebook as well. Don't know who it is that's, that's posted this, but thanks for getting involved. The 5 0 win at Easter Road was the first game after Rangers went into administration. Big party at Easter Road that day. Yes, it was. And Paddy can't remember last week, never mind 2012. Uh -huh. I need visual triggers, Paddy. That's why I says to JP, what jersey were we wearing that day? And then I started seeing 
the, the goal scorers. Now, let's see. Have we had anybody telling us who scored the goals that day without checking the wiki? Because that's cheating. Um, anybody? I can't actually see it. The first one uh, was Ki Sung Young that I remembered uh, uh-huh. scoring that day. And I remember, I remember his uh, celebration as well. He was a fantastic player. I think he's still playing, actually. Yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there were others. Somebody got a double. I can't actually see anybody coming in this. I'm going to have to put you out your misery, I think. Um, but we'll see before the end of the show. There's still five minutes to go. Um, but there is, there's plenty of dilemmas going into this game. Uh, but let's let's be honest though, JP, right? So if Jota doesn't make the cut, what an option off the bench. If O'Reilly doesn't make the cut, brilliant option off the bench. Mm. And then you've got the situation up top with Kyogo and Yakamakis. By the way, there's a guy called Hak Zivanovic that we've not mentioned either. Exactly. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> not bad to have as a as a weapon. Um, he was in a, he was in the film well last night, apparently, so it wasn't an that injury. Was, that was a... Yeah. Um and I think, you know, there was a discussion um last week about players who'll come into their own in the second half of the season. And spoke about slow burners. Um and Hak Zivanovic was in that category when he was talking about them. The other kind of players I was thinking of were at the time Abulgar, who somehow made it back onto the bench um, in the last week, and the, the third player was Burnaby, who hasn't been playing because Greg Taylor's been so good this season. I thought Burnaby played pretty well when he came on mm. last night. Uh, but of the three, I think it's kind of obvious that Haksabanovic is the one that you would call upon, um, you know, off the bench. Haksabanovic put potentially O'Reilly on the bench, potentially Jota, James Forrest. But the other one that's been the point of massive discussion this week was Kyogo and Yakamakis. So we had lots of people commenting about Kyogo. Very similar to what has been said today about O'Reilly. He needs dropped, he needs rested, get Yakamakis in. Yakamakis terrorises Rangers, etc, etc. And I get that because I remember the February game thought Yakimakis was a pest. He was an absolute pest to Rangers that, that night. Um, and then, when we beat them 4-0 earlier this season, I was wanting Yakimakis to start. I certainly didn't want him to come on under the circumstances in which he did, because Kyogo got injured. But there's no way I'm dropping Kyogo for Monday. No way. No. no I mean, I think I got pelters in the comments last week from somebody saying, oh, you can't comment on an individual player if you've not watched the game. Um, Jack and Marcus should have started, etc., uh, etc. Et and then after the weekend, somebody replied to that comment and said, well, what are you saying now? Because he scored uh, two at the weekend. Jack and Marcus comes on and doesn't do anything uh, or little of little note. I don't, I'm not saying Jack and Marcus is suddenly a bad player. Of course he's not. He's, he's done he's done really great since he's been at Celtic and, and scored a lot of crucial goals that won his league last season. But when Kyogo Furashi's in that type of form and you see him taking that touch like he did last night, you know, letting it kind of almost brush off his thigh and then to to chop and then finish so coolly. I mean, that was like a FIFA goal. I mean, there, was, there was no two ways about it. That was coolness personified. Or, or sensible soccer. If, yeah, you like, but, if you want but, to go a wee bit further back for the oldies. I, I, yeah, I don't remember ever being able to... See a goal of that beauty in sensible soccer, considering it was like what, a helicopter or a bird's eye view. Where you just saw the, the top of someone's head and the, the wee foot kind of sticking out every now and then. Love it, was, it was good at the time, it was good at the time, especially with all the fake names. Remember, like you used to have like um, oh. Paul Mintz and uh, <laughs> Steve Brush. Uh, it's just because I went Man United all the time. I remember all the, the Man United play. I don't know, they didn't have they obviously didn't have the license and. That's it. The original players. It was like the original, what was then championship manager. Yeah. All, all the all the kids of today will know as football manager, but it originally was championship manager. And I think the first one was maybe ninety two, mm-hmm. by the way. And I played it to death. And it was all made up names. So you know, it just in time you got the license. But one game that did have the license, JP, was Manchester United Europe. Did you ever play that? No, I didn't it, no. it was after. Uh, Man U had won the, the Cup Winners' Cup. Pretty sure Mark Hughes scored a double. Um, right. And the, this computer game, came, it was, the graphics were immense. Sorry, we digress. We'll get back onto the music, right? We <laughs> digress. We're talking about computer games here. Um, there's a few other points I want to talk about, right? Uh, the first one being Rudy Vata's son Rocco comes on last night and makes his debut. And uh, when he came on, I was delighted that we were wearing that away strip, I've got to mm. say. 
Uh, not because I'm superstitious, I'm sure we will win wearing the grey away kit that JP modelled earlier this season on the show. Um, but I do remember Rudy wearing that original, the Umbro original, um, yeah, which was fantastic. What a beautiful strip that was. Uh, but it's so important for me, I think it's so important to get Rocco Vata game time. And hopefully we'll also see uh, Boston Labo getting some game time as well. But then it begs the question, JP, you know, we had Labo on the bench against St. Johnson. We had Vata on the bench last night against Hibs. He comes on, brilliant, delighted for him, gets about 10 minutes. Any of the two players on the bench at Ibrox? you got to think it's going to be too strong. Like the bench, with the uh, the level of player that we've got competing for actual first-team starts, is there room for them on the bench? I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, obviously, Ange Postecoglou would trusted them to play in a game of I mean, last night's game was was huge. Everybody was saying that beforehand. About a lot of people were saying they were more worried about last night than they were about Monday, yeah. which maybe is a little bit uh, uh, um, over the top. But I was concerned about last night because you just sometimes you don't know what Hibs team you're going to be playing, especially Easter Road. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, I think he, he's obviously trusting them to get game time in, in a game like that. So. Wouldn't be on the realm. Be, be beyond the realms. Is is Vata's Vata position a striker? You know, an out striker. Is that what he's? He can also play on the wing. JP right. he can play on the wing. But the thing that that you know I find interesting is we we often talk about youth development, giving youth a chance, creating the, the you know the, the pathway to the first team. We're going to Ibrox on Monday, and straight away I'm thinking, do you put them on the bench? You know, Haksabanovic is going to be back. So that that's mm-hmm. one position. Um, so I, I totally get how difficult it is. But remember, Ange threw Ben Dokin against Rangers in February when we beat them 3-0 at Celtic mm-hmm. Park. He got an appearance. Um, maybe it's a wee bit too soon for Vata. I, I'm delighted he's made his debut at JP. I hope we hold on to him. I hope he's not joining the litany of uh, players who have flown the nest in recent years. Uh, obviously, um, he's already been capped right up to, I think, under, is it under 19? I'm not sure if he's got an under 21 cap yet for Ireland through um, through his mother's side, through his mother's bloodline. So I'm delighted with that. Uh, Rudy Vata, cult hero. Uh, but there was a chat last night around the away strips because obviously it's a kind of remake or a reimagining of that classic 1990s away jersey. And um, Laura Bradburn of Axom was talking about how well Yakamakis was wearing it. And I says, well, that's that's the current GG. The GG who modelled it originally was Gary Gillespie. And huh. they, model, they modelled it in the club catalogue that used to come out. JP, don't know if you remember, there used to be a catalogue and it would come in oh, a Celtic, yeah, yeah. A Celtic view. Oh, they're and brilliant. They're and absolutely and brilliant. <laughs> and Gary Gillespie. I think Gary back as the 90s but I think yeah. I've definitely got well early 90s I think I've got some mid 90s ones with Simon Donnelly and Jackie McNamara is that in... Donnelly modelling the bedspread and all that I remember all this stuff <laughs> <laughs> Gary right. Gillespie yeah. modelling yeah. the away jersey Celtic mm-hmm. dressing gowns like Jackie uh-huh. McNamara and Simon Donnelly awkwardly wearing Celtic dressing gowns in a Celtic in a Celtic we're, we're mug with a Celtic <laughs> mug <laughs> Absolutely tremendous and big meow, but he was always chosen to model the jerseys and all that as well. Um, but I can understand why. Let's remember for a moment before we uh, wrap up, uh, this will be your last appearance of the year, JP, uh, before we wrap up, Phil O'Donnell. Uh, it's the anniversary of Phil's passing. I remember when we signed him from Motherwell and, and remember at the time, Tommy Burns' team, JP, and the midfield being made up with Paul McStay and... Uh, John Collins at that time and remi- and thinking to myself, wow, you're putting Phil O'Donnell in that midfield and, and the mind just absolutely boggled. He was tormented with injuries at Celtic, but when he played, you know, he was a tremendous player. I remember him at Motherwell being part of that Scottish Cup win against Dundee United, the 4-3 game, and PSV Eindhoven were trying to sign him. Aston Villa were trying to sign him. He was part of that Scotland team in 1992, the under-21 team that done so well in the European Championship. So, yeah, thoughts and prayers uh, with Phil. I know that he was very tight with Sid, Simon, who you yeah. just mentioned. Um, and we always remember um, the players who donned the green and white hoops. And I just remember his, cel- his celebration. He would always kind of do that like with his hands. That's right, aye. 
That's and, right. And there was a goal, uh, little Z shared yesterday from a game, uh, either yesterday or the day before, and uh, I think it, it was 98, and it would have been my first visit to... Uh, there you go. Um, my first visit to Dens Park and Phil O'Donnell scored and it was like a really great pass through the middle and he, and he kind of took a touch, beat the man and then just dinked it with his left foot past the keeper. And he, 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 that was quite a that was quite a common finish for him, like you know, that we kind of like dink past the keeper, like because he, he always made those for, those those runs. I mean, how many times have you have we said in the years since Phil O'Donnell, oh, it'd be great to get an attacking midfielder who does box to box runs like Phil O'Donnell? Like mm-hmm. he always gets referenced, and yeah, it was it was. I remember that day very well. I remember exactly where I was. It was at a pub in the south side, and I got the news, and I just was so so gutted, like just because he'd been a big part of my childhood. Like obviously, never got to meet him or anything like that. Just it, I, he just was. Alongside likes of John Collins and Simon Donnelly, and uh, you know all, all those guys in that in that mid nineties team were the sort of they were my Celtic team. The, the eighty eight team was the team that I kind of fell in love with Celtic, but I didn't wasn't going regularly at that at, at that time. But it was in the sort of ninety three ninety four was when the obsession really kicked in, and I was like cutting uh, newspaper clippings of anything Celtic, and I've still got them all like. Scrapbooks, Polly Pockets, fully lit pictures of uh, the Canio and uh, I don't know <laughs> David Hanna. <laughs> 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 to, to show you the sort of uh, chasm that there was in terms of quality. No offence to David Hanna, but you know we had some unbelievably talented footballers and some not so talented footballers. Malky Mackay at centre uh, half, for example. Yeah, I mean, yes. but, they, but, but they were all important in that time and. and you know, they, they contributed as best they could. I'm sure they didn't come to Celtic uh, to, to not do their best. Um, it's just unfortunate that we, as a club at that time, were pretty hamstrung with everything that was going on. And God bless Fergus McCann for changing that. Yeah, for sure. It's been an absolute pleasure, it always is, when JP joins us on a Thursday uh, for the Axon Bullet. And thanks everybody for getting involved. In the comments section, I hope everybody has a tremendous new year and, um, th- you know, all your plans for 2023 all work out. It's always a great a great time, JP, just to uh, refresh and, and start planning afresh for the new year. So I hope everybody can spend some time with friends and family. And um, I hope you enjoy the second as well. JP Mason, always a pleasure. Thank you again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Cheers, bro.